everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity to present. This has been a really great session and really great talks. So I'm Charu Vardarajan, and I'm a research scientist in the Earth and Environmental Sciences area at Um And my scientific expertise is in using data-driven methods for studying water resources. And I'm also involved in a number of other data science efforts uh, with the US Department of Energy. I'm also a senior fellow at the Berkeley Institute of Data Sciences. So this talk today represents the work of several people. I've been really lucky to work with interdisciplinary teams. It's one of the perks of working in a national lab. And several of my co-authors are from the computing sciences area in the lab. And in particular, I want to acknowledge Julie Mueller and her postdocs, Ritik Sahu and Django Park, who really did much of the machine learning I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, so we're now collecting water data at an increasingly rapid pace and machine learning is already transforming how we're making predictions in very complex systems such as watersheds and river basins. So uh, in the past uh, couple of years, the field of machine learning for aquatic science and hydrology has just exploded and it's been a very exciting time. But water data today, as we've heard uh, even earlier in this session, is really heterogeneous. We have multi-scale, multidisciplinary data, and we ideally want to make use of all data that's available to make predictions. But right now, our ability to use machine learning is limited with, when we're trying to diversify the types of data we're using because our approaches to building models are brute force and inefficient and kind of rely on trying out the kitchen sink approach where we try everything out to achieve the best prediction accuracy. So if you want to make predictions at scale for a variety of problems, um, let's see, my clicks here are not working. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, okay, here we go. Um, we need to think about reducing the computational and human overhead of building machine learning models without sacrificing accuracy. So today I'm gonna to uh, talk about a few approaches we're using in two projects to address this challenge. So the first approach is to make mathematical improvements, which is what we're doing for a project that uses surrogate models um, combined with machine learning to predict groundwater levels in California. And this research was motivated by California's historic Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that requires local agencies to manage their groundwater sustainably and reduce undesirable impacts. So although some parts of the state, such as the Central Valley, have decades of work building multi-physics, multi-scale uh, uh, models, most other parts of California don't really have such models available. And typically, the smaller agencies don't even have access to supercomputer resources. So our research objective here was to build fast, efficient neural network-based models that could replace these computationally expensive, high-fidelity models to enable stakeholders to make timely decisions for groundwater management just on their laptops. So we started off with building deep learning models for some wells in Butte County, which is in Northern California. And we primarily chose this region because there was data available there. And by high resolution data, what we mean is actually daily data for groundwater and uh, meteorology. Um, and data availability turned out to be a pretty big challenge because that, that wasn't the original region we would have targeted. We were originally eyeing something like the Salinas Basin, which is a high priority basin for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. But uh, when we looked at the data there, there were only two data points a year. So we had to end up sort of switching. And by the time we actually ended up doing our analysis and the papers, um, actually the water withdrawals in Butte were high enough that it ended up becoming a high priority um, uh, uh, station for a uh, place for Sigma. So that's um, good for us, but very unfortunate for the residents of Butte County. Um, so we considered four different popular neural network model choices here, the multi-layer perceptron, the convolutional neural network, and the recurrent neural network and its variant, the LSTM, which we thought would be good fits. The last two would be good fits for the uh, modeling the temporal dynamics of the system. And each of these models had different hyperparameters to tune. And these hyperparameters determine the network's uh, learning capacity and uh, prediction capacity. So an important hyperparameter that we decided to account uh, include here to account for all the memory effects that happen in groundwater systems is the lag. And the lag here is the number of past observations that could influence the next day's values. So all in all, when we started uh, 
to look at all the different hyperparameters and the ranges that we would want to consider, we realized that actually would end up with hundreds of thousands to millions of potential combinations to hand tune, which obviously was very computationally expensive. So Julie uh, had uh, developed uh, previously a black box optimization approach um, that uses surrogate uh, probabilistic models, which are namely radial basis functions and Gaussian process models to and converge to the ideal hyperparameter space much more quickly. And so we published um, this in a, in a recent paper. And uh, after we did the uh, develop that HPO approach, we also set up the models using five different input features for, for that included uh, for, uh, for the training and for the hyperparameter optimization. So this was prior groundwater level uh, measurements, temperature, precipitation, uh, the nearest river discharge um, that was sort of supposed to be indicative of surface groundwater exchange, and the week of the year, which was supposed to capture the seasonality. And for the out of sample predictions, we only use the temperature and precip data to generate the predictions. And these were applied to single and multi-world scenarios. So we had a roughly 60, 20, 20 split for the training, the testing for the hyperparameter optimization, and then the out of sample prediction range. So the results here shows that surprisingly, it was actually, we didn't expect this, that the multi-layer perceptron actually outperformed all the other models. Uh, and this was about four to six layers here. Um, it, it, and it was not just in terms of prediction error here, it was also in terms of computational expense that multilayer perceptron was about an order of magnitude less than the other models. And the key turned out to be this optimal selection of these hyperparameters. Um, so in particular, for instance, these LSTMs and recurrent neural networks that we thought would do well actually couldn't capture a longer lag time. So they sort of uh, stopped working when you had a lag of over 60 days. But these MLP and the, the uh, convolutional neural network were able to account for about a year's worth of prior history, which it turns out to be really important um, in predicting groundwater system. So um, the other thing we realized is that we, we had to run several trials um, for this optimization because the results were slightly different depending on the random seed uh, for the, the surrogate model. But uh, so there's some stochasticity in the model itself. But overall, we got pretty good predictions for all the different ensemble runs here for up to a year's worth. So we were just predicting the next day's value and using the prediction to keep predicting the, the, the future values. So this was up to a year out we could predict fairly well. Um, all right. Seems to be okay. Oops, that's going too much. All right. Um, so here, uh, I just want to some some. Oops, it's getting a slide here. We actually also then did some follow on work to explore the influence of differences in input features on the prediction outcomes, partly to see whether we could reduce the amount of time it took to train the model by dropping features and also because we anticipate some data such as the discharge won't be available everywhere at the desired resolutions or periods of time monitored. So we had three different scenario, uh, nine different scenarios for three groundwater wells in Butte, Shasta, and Tehama counties, which are high, medium, and low sigma priority basins based on their water withdrawals here. Um, and, and these are all the different scenarios that we ran. So the, the take home message here is we had two major conclusions. The first is that the hydrological variables, which are primarily the precip and the discharge are essential to obtain good predictions. If we drop both of them, uh, such as this groundwater temperature scenario, the errors really shoot up. So that being said, it's also not necessary to use all the available data for all locations. So for example, discharge, which is the surface groundwater exchange turned out to be less influential in in the Butte region, where um, groundwater pumping dominates the water balance over everything. So this is all sort of jiving with our hydrological understanding of the system. So to sort of summarize this approach, there are two key messages here. First is that that automated hyperparameter optimization approach dramatically increases the efficiency of building the models and allows us to explore a much larger parameter space without hand tuning everything. And also based on a parameter sensitivity test, it's uh, you know, promising that the obvious hydrological variable choice that we would go after turned out to be the most predictive. But it's also interesting that the choice of variables that gives the best performance varies by location, which is what we would intuitively expect based on our knowledge of hydrology. So this indicates that there's potential for just not using all the data that's available and throwing it at the model, but being clever about how we select some input features used based on some hydrological understanding of the system. 
Um, so I'm now going to switch gears um, and uh, move to another project. Um, so it's, it's just taking a while to load. I'm not sure why. Um, there we go. Um, this is a, a project which is a DOE early career project, um, and it's mostly aspirational because it just got funded last September, uh, but I'm going to be using a second approach that's really starting to think about how we can use knowledge guided data science to do predictions of river water quality here. So the research objective is to understand the impacts of stream flow disturbances, both floods and droughts to water quality here, and we'll be exploring whether we can infer knowledge about river corridor responses to disturbance as emergent properties that yield transferable insights using data-driven approaches as part of a framework to build better machine learning models. So this work is going to focus on uh, three river corridors, the Delaware, uh, and then the Colorado, as well as the Columbia rivers, these are important, not just for the nation, but for the Department of Energy. And for this work, I'm, by water quality, I'm just referring to three different variables, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and conductivity, which are very important for water managers, but also uh, in, for, from the machine learning perspective, they have high resolution data available. So the existing paradigm of using process-based models alone doesn't work to predict water quality across very large spatial scales because we have really complex interactions that occur in, in, across space and time in watersheds. And the computational expense uh, uh, and the data that we would need to run such models just makes it very challenging to run. So here, there's this figure here that shows perhaps all, all many different factors that really affect river water quality. And for each of these factors, we have many different data sets. So this can be a really big challenge. So what we're interested in doing is using machine learning and particularly knowledge guided machine learning to think about how we can reduce this complexity for both um, short as well as long term predictions. Um, and so here, you know, I, I'm going to cover three different science questions. Um, okay, so uh, it, it, that are structured to add complexity. Um, and sort of the science questions are the analogy of the shoe that Allison talked about. It's really a great analogy. Uh, we have to sort of tailor our models to be addressing these science questions. And so the first question um, is about how do uh, disturbances impact water quality at a single location? So point to read scales at short and long time scales. The second starts to expand on the spatial scale and is focused on understanding the impacts downstream along the river corridor and across river orders. And the third question then starts to broaden out to look at the landscape interactions with the rivers to determine how watershed properties can impact water quality. So ultimately, these questions seek to determine a resistance or resilience index of water quality as a function of disturbance and watershed properties. Um, so my approach here um, is going to use a, a variety of data-driven methods uh, for uh, the predictions. And so recently, there's been actually a growing number of studies that look at these long term water monitoring data sets. And these have included classical approaches such as regression to determine long term trends, identifying patterns in hydrogeochemical behavior, in this case, using Boltzmann machines or, or convolutional neural networks, um, methods to use information theory or causal inferences, as we heard even earlier today, to determine the drivers behind observed variables, and finally, using some of the data in machine learning, which is already just beginning to show a lot of promise. But however, to date, most of these data-driven approaches have been used mostly in isolation and make use of a limited amount of data, relying on one-off products that are not updated with new data. So there seems to be this opportunity here to think about this more holistically, using some of these analytical methods to understand the underlying phenomena and the emergent patterns to help us build better machine learning models that are more scalable, interpre interpretable, and transferable. So my approach is to derive some physical information by using different types of data analysis to answer the different science questions. So here, for example, the first science question here, I'm looking to tease out some emergent properties such as resistance, uh, which is a change of the signal after the disturbance of the resilience, which is the ability of the system to bounce back uh, after a disturbance um, and the lagged effects of prior events and disturbances on water quality. So I'll be doing this analysis on multiple timescales using wavelet multi-resolution analysis. 
Um, and the hypothesis here is just that these emergent properties can help determine which machine learning model, model architecture, features, and hyperparameters to choose. So for example, if a system has a very long lag, it seems like based on sort of our prior work, we can't just choose an LSTM since that may not be able to represent a sequence that long, but the lag can also become the hyperparameter that we have in the model. So other questions that we can ask are whether we need a single model for an entire basin or for all rivers, or whether we should have different models based on some inherent grouping that's either spatial by watersheds or, that, or, or temporal by some stochastic regimes. Um, so uh, what the, the idea here is to then, sorry, it's taking a moment to load here. Um, is to build this uh, data-driven framework that will contain an analytical module where the core elements are the outcomes of an analysis done for a particular science question and ultimately build up to the machine learning model for the prediction. So um, for, for example, here, we're gonna start with that same deep learning algorithm with the hyperparameter optimization for the point scale science question to predict that the point scale what the water quality is. But the framework is also going to have a data integration component here that pulls data from various sources on demand to make the data analysis repeatable, reproducible, and not based on one-off products. And just sort of given the diversity of data that's available and potentially usable in this research, this becomes really important to do because we need to try to make use of as much data as we have um, to arrive at the right results. So for this purpose, we're building a data integration piece of the framework as a base capability that allows us to pull in new data on demand. This is a software called Basin 3D that connects to diverse data sources and transforms data and metadata into a standardized format. So the software has two modes. The first is a Django-based tool that supports web services and portals for data discovery and visualization. We've done that for another project already. But for this uh, early career of work, we had extended the software to become an installable Python module that can flexibly connect to different data sources and be used for data analysis within a Jupyter notebook. So this harmonizes all the data into sort of a single data frame for the analysis, which seems to be truly unique because this then starts to deal with the problem of bringing data into a common format, which is just a really a major pain point for building machine learning models. So to summarize here, what we're doing is to look ahead and move towards using a cascading series of data analysis to answer science questions or test hypotheses that can then provide us a more structured way of incorporating our domain knowledge in the machine learning. And ideally that'll help us improve both the model accuracy as well as the time it takes to build these models. We're also building this software to, uh, that will provide long lasting capabilities to synthesize data into a uniform format and incorporate new data as they become available and reduce our reliance on these one-off data products. I just also, since we had a lot of questions earlier about extremes, uh, I wanna say that dealing with extremes has a lot of challenges. There's more missing data because there's less, um, you know, there's more, uh, a tendency for sensors to fail, and traditional error minimization approaches don't work. We have skewed distributions, etc. So to conclude, I want to just say that you know the key take-home message is that knowledge-guided machine learning is this unicorn space shown in this Venn diagram. It's the confluence of math, computer science, and domain science. So in our projects, what we've done is to try to uh, match up mathematical advances such as the hyperparameter optimization with some computational advances such as cyber infrastructure for model data integration and data pre-processing with the domain analysis to help inform the choice of model architecture and parameters. I'd also like to call out in general, um, you know, we need more benchmark data to compare our models. And I would love to see some movement there to start to generate more fair data, uh, which are machine readable data products we can use for the machine learning. And um, as we've heard from many of the great talks in this workshop, this is, the important thing is to enable the collaborations by ensuring that all these partners across these disciplines are recognized and credited for moving this field forward. So with that, I just wanna thank everybody for listening. Uh, I also happen to be looking for a postdoc, so please contact me if you're interested. Um, yeah, and these are everybody I wanna acknowledge, including my funding. Very, thank you. That was great. And another fantastic postdoc opportunity. Um, question for you, in groundwater level prediction, can you factor groundwater pumping rates as a predictor? We would love to. There's no data on it, unfortunately. Uh, California doesn't monitor pumping. We've tried a lot of different ways to 
uh, estimate proxies for pumping and it's just really hard. You'd think if anywhere would monitor pumping, it would be California, but um, I think maybe in the panel, we'll get back to what types of data we should be monitoring. Um, well, thank you very much. That was great. 